previously on this series. I always wanted to build my own go-kart. And I could build a real one. So it took me almost half a year to fully plan every single aspect of the project. Where would I build it? How much would it cost? What donor car should I use? What part should I start with? What about approval? Would I be able to legally drive it on the road? What about insurance? It was literally a great big puzzle that I had to solve bit by bit and in the right order for this project to succeed. Now the donor car could have really have been anything, but again, thinking low cost, it had to be a cheap, relatively old car with real world drive, produced in vast numbers, and whose spare parts would be plentiful and cheap. That narrowed it down quite a bit, and for me there was only one candidate at the time for this. I found a 1987 Ford Sierra with about 200,000 miles on the clock for 200 pounds. So now I had the keys to a stinky old Ford. Item one out of about a thousand crossed out. And now for the rest. This is a story about the pursuit of a lifelong dream. To build my own car from scratch and drive it on the road. A dream that would be met with countless challenges, filled with massive highs and deep lows, encouraged only by the belief that someday I would be driving my own home-built car on the road. This would become my best account on how to approach life as a pursuit of your own interests and passions. Having learned at a very young age that nothing comes for free, that if you want something, you have to do it yourself. You have to get out of your comfort zone and get cracking. Pursue your passion, no matter what it takes. This is a four episode story on how I built my own car from scratch, proving that you can accomplish anything you set your mind upon. My name is Tom, and this is my story. So once I had planned how to build a car as best as I could, I needed to learn how to weld. Almost 90% of the whole project involved welding in one form or another. I began learning with various bits of off-cut steel, different thicknesses, etc. until I got the hang of it. Now normally you'd weld a car chassis with a MIG or metal inert gas welder, which is easier to learn than traditional arc welding, and it gives you more consistency, but they're very expensive. So I went with a trusty old arc welder, which was a fraction of the price of the mill welder. I also had to buy a welding mask, and for this I had two choices. Either the fancy, automatically dimming ones, which cost about £150, or the box standard ones that you have to manually put on and off before welding, which cost about a tenner. Again, I went for the cheaper one. Now, in hindsight, I probably should have bought the fancy one because quite frequently it took me quite some effort to get the arc going, as it's pretty much like lighting a damp match. So you never really know when the arc is going to form and a blinding flash of light hits your face before you can put the visor down. So before committing to the chassis, I had to test whether my welding skills were up to par or not. And I needed a crane to hoist the engine and gearbox out of the Sierra. Remember the donor car I had bought earlier? Now a proper engine crane would have sent me back around 300 quid. So in the spirit of the no cost mentality, I decided to build my own crane and use that to test my welding skills. So I decided a simple crane shape out of steel box tube all the wheels out of my roller skates, I still had them, and an electric winch from the hardware store. It all cost me less than 50 bucks. The next biggest part was getting all the pieces I needed out of this era. This included the engine, steering, brakes, suspension, gearbox, differential, and various other bits and bobs. It took me almost a whole day to get the engine out. This car was filthy. I mean, if it looked filthy and uncared for from the outside, the engine bay had 20 odd years of oil, mud, grime, roadkill, whatnot stuck to it. Manhandling it out of the car was like trying to grab a grease pig. Once I had all the bits I needed from the Sierra, I went on to buy the steel, around 20 meters of square and round tube, and about 25 square meters of uh, steel and aluminum plate all of various thicknesses. So the build plan would go roughly like this. I'd have to cut and weld all the different steel tube sections to make the chassis, cut, bend and weld the steel roll bar, cut and weld the rear axle and front wishbones, again from steel, make the fuel tank by cutting, bending and welding steel plate, cutting, riveting and bonding the aluminium floor, front and rear firewalls, the interior panels, the bodywork, and then, out of fabric glass, make the scuttle, nose cone and wheel arches. And finally the bonnet in aluminium. This doesn't include all the other stuff like seats, interior trim, wiring, piping, engine bay bits, steering, seat belts, windscreen. 
Everything had to be done in order though, as I couldn't undo anything at a later stage or it would have been very expensive and time consuming. So off I went. June 2006, I began to cut and weld the chassis together. This was a particularly arduous job as I had to cut every single piece by hand and at complex angles. In many cases having to use a hand file to get to those angles. It took me about a month working about 10 hours per day, 7 days per week to complete the basic chassis. And this quickly annoyed my neighbours as our house was in a block of flats and cutting, grinding and hammering in the open terrace day in and day out quickly earned me a noise warning from the police. So I had to break a deal with all the neighbours where I would be working only during work hours on work days during the summer holidays. This severely pushed back the project schedule and I had to rearrange the whole build plan to schedule in noisy and silent activities. Also, I could only work during the months of June until late August, partly because of the weather, but mostly because I had to attend my classes and exams at university the rest of the year. So on the days I couldn't make noise, I would dedicate the time to all the silent stuff, like rebuilding the engine and gearbox from the Sierra, and cleaning and restoring many other parts I gathered along the way. This was the first time I could completely tear apart an engine and see inside. Obviously, I first had to scrape off the 20 odd years of oil, mud, grime and whatnot stuck onto it. I replaced every gasket, seal, bearing and ring on this engine to ensure that it would run as if it left the factory. Now, the biggest reason why I chose the Ford Sierra as a donor car, apart from the fact that I bought it for 200 pounds, was due to the simplicity of the engine. It's a two liter, four cylinder, eight valve, single overhead can, commonly known as the Pinto engine. These engines have been made by the millions and it wasn't fitted only to the Sierra. It found itself in the Cortina, the Escort, the Capri, the Granada, the Scorpio, the Transit van, and even the infamous Pinto in the US, from which this engine got its nickname. This engine was a jack of all trades for Ford, so spares for this engine are still plentiful and very cheap. The one that came with my Sierra produced around 100 horsepower and around 170 pound feet of torque when it was new, which is rather good for a 500 kilogram sports car, <laughs> but I wanted more horsepower. So one of the first things I did to increase its power was to fit a carburetor from a 1998 Yamaha R1 motorbike, which has four 40 millimeter carbs, one per cylinder, unlike the crappy single barrel carburetor that came with the Sierra. And I also updated the ignition system from a rather old and unreliable distributor solenoid combination to a fully electronical customizable ECU ignition. All this should increase the power to around the 130 horsepower mark. Another thing I had to do to adapt the engine and drivetrain to the new car was to shorten the prop shaft, you know, the thing that connects the gearbox to the differential at the back. Given the rotating speeds it can achieve, I had it shortened by a specialist who welded it and balanced it perfectly because you don't want a spinning prop shaft to explode right next to your waist, which is where it's mounted in the car. After that came the axles themselves. The front is a double wishbone design, which is easy enough to make. For the rear axle though, I had three options to choose from. Either a live rear axle, a De Dion axle, or a fully independent suspension. Now given the complexity of a fully independent suspension and the drawbacks of a live axle, I went with a De Dion setup. The De Dion is a compromise between a live axle and a fully independent rear axle in that it allows each wheel to move more independently of one another compared to a live axle, but it has more unsprung weight than a fully independent rear axle. Actually, it can be found in many front wheel drive cars where their rear axle consists of a main beam connected to the chassis by trailing arms to control vertical movement and what's known as a panel hard rod mounted parallel to the beam to control horizontal movement or roll. Now the most challenging part of building the rear axle was aligning it square to the chassis because any deviation in relation to the chassis would eventually cause the car to crab to one side while driving. Once I was certain the axle was square to the chassis and the alignment was bang on, I tack welded it and sent it to the professional welder again for peace of mind. You know, I didn't want a wheel flying off at speed this time. Now by that time autumn was looming and I had to go back to class so the project would be halted pretty much until the following summer. 2007 came by and it was time to continue the build. I had to develop a checklist of the things I had to do in the right order and I went right back to work. I started with a floor panel which was cut from aluminium and bonded and riveted to the chassis. Next came the fuel tank. This was made out of steel plate and I bent it into a rectangular box using a bending jig I made because a proper hydraulic one would have cost thousands. Wait for it. Low cost! Mentality. The fuel tank was challenging in that I needed to weld it as best as I could in a single continuous bead with no pinholes or else it would eventually leak petrol. So now the axles were finished, the suspension was sorted and the car sat on its own feet for the very first time. I could move the car about and play with a working steering wheel. Every step forward in the build was a cause for celebration. I wasn't bothered about the thousand or so steps I had left to go. Seeing the car slowly take shape was brilliant. I spent hours sitting on it and pretending to drive it, making engine noises, pretending to shift, accelerate, brake, imagining how it would be like to drive it on the road for real. These were the moments that encouraged me to complete the project. Now that I could sit on the car, I had to plan on how to make the seats. 
Of course, I could have just bought two brand new seats or had them tailor made, but they were very expensive. So applying the low cost mentality, counting coins for eternity. You don't have to skimp on quality, but you'll have to deal with adversity. I made my own. I sketched a cutout drawing of the seats on a piece of paper first to determine the measurements and then transferred it to a steel sheet which I then cut, bent and welded together. The seats would then be filled with foam and then upholstered with fake leather. Now for this last bit I really didn't have the time or the interest to learn how to upholster so I just sent the seats to an upholsterer for the last part of the job. But just a week later I got the seats back, beautifully upholstered and tried them on the car. Now the fake engine noises and pretend shifting only increased. I then decided to tackle the fiberglass panels. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Cosa. O, o la fibra de vidrio que... Cuando se puso a inventar fibra de vidrio, en lugar de ir y buscar las piezas ya compradas, se pone a fabricar fibra de vidrio. I started to make the molds of the scuttle panel, nose cone and wheel arches out of chicken wire and paper mache to be later covered with plaster which would be sanded and primed for the fiberglass. Fiberglass is remarkably easy to work with once you know the process as all you do is layer up various kinds of fiberglass mat with epoxy resin over a gel coated mold. Once it cures it becomes a hard plastic that you can use as bodywork. The challenging part of the process is that once you mix the resin it starts to cure quite rapidly so you literally have minutes to smack all the fiberglass on and paint the rapid curing resin over each layer without any air bubbles forming in between the layers. But once you get the hang of it and you separate the first cured fiberglass panels, the results are incredibly rewarding. This whole process nevertheless took ages. I spent pretty much all that summer making these panels. In hindsight, it probably would have been faster to have bought some similar ones already made and adapt them to my car. But that was against the No look. cost mentality! Wait, I was gonna say it this time. So summer went by, autumn and university looming again and the project came to the standby, again. In 2008, I had decided it was time to concentrate back again on the mechanical side of the car, designing and building the brake system, fitting the engine and gearbox into the chassis for the first time, and the rest of the parts that would go into the engine bay. I needed to source all the additional parts that would be bolted onto the car, so I went to a scrapyard to rummage around for parts I would need. Now, the best thing about sourcing parts from the scrapyard is that if you choose wisely for a part that's in good condition, you can fix your car, or in my case, build one very cheaply. 2009 was the summer where the car finally began to take its final shape with all the fiberglass panels. I could now start to work on the bonnet, which was cut and bent by hand from an aluminium sheet. 2010 through 2013 marked a sort of hiatus in the project. Now with a full-time job and other personal issues, I could barely dedicate any time to continue with the build. But I did manage to fit in some time to cut and rivet in the aluminium bodywork panels. These were quite simple to make, I just had to remember to measure at least 5 times I cut once. In 2014, I decided to dedicate my entire summer holidays to the car again, full time. And this time, I would really get a move on. Now that the big stuff was done, uh, it was time for the fun stuff. The interior, dashboard and electrics. For the dashboard, I designed the layout I wanted on paper first and began cutting marine plywood to fit it in the car. The layout consists of the speedometer, signal cluster in the middle, rev counter and 3 additional gauges, water temperature, fuel gauge and voltmeter. It also needed a glove box in some sort as the car has barely any storage space. I then proceeded to make the windscreen using aluminium channel like the sort you might find on the windows of your house or the shower screen in your bathroom. The glass itself had to be laminated for safety issues as well as regulations. So I went back to the scrapyard and I got a flat windscreen from an early Fiat Panda. Then I took it to a glass specialist to cut it to size. Now the electrics were always a part of the build I always dreaded, given the sheer complexity of wiring a car. There are so many different circuits to that, that have to be connected together, through relays, switches, fuses, solenoids, the ignition switch, and then finally the battery. Even though this car is way simpler than an ordinary production car, it still has over 30 different circuits. So I had to really had to remember my GCSE physics to calculate voltage drops, resistance, wire diameters, fuse ratings, relays. If the whole build can be considered a giant puzzle, the wiring was another massive puzzle by itself. So I obtained the wiring diagrams out of the Sierra, which looked like hieroglyphics. I crossed out all the circuits that didn't apply, like the ABS control unit or interior lights, and then calculated how many wires, fuses, connections, relays I needed. About around 200 meters of cable of different colors and thicknesses, and began cutting and crimping wires together, one circuit at a time. Now I did say earlier that the electrics were part of the fun stuff, and yeah, cutting, peeling, crimping and soldering hundreds of cables was not exactly fun. In fact, it was a right pain in the neck. But because I had to test every circuit before going on with the next, I could see everything come to life with every single test. It was brilliant. So once I had everything connected and working first time with no massive sparks, burnt cables or having electrocuted myself, 
The car began to have a life of its own. All that was left at this stage was the finishing touches, trim and paint. 2015 was the final year of the build. The car was almost finished. I trimmed the interior with carpet and made the rear boot lid out of marine plywood and leather. I also finished up the bonnet by riveting on louvers from the local hardware store. You know, the sort you might find for household ventilation. I didn't have the tools to make the proper louvers, so in order to hide the edges, I applied some bodywork filler and presto. Low-cost mentality, bruh. Now regarding paint, I knew from the beginning that A, I couldn't afford to buy the proper equipment, you know, spray gun, air compressor, masks, paint. B, I didn't have the skill to do it properly or the time to learn. It requires years of experience apparently. And C, even if I could do A and B, in order to do it properly, you need a spray booth or at least a dust-free environment, neither of which I had. And I didn't really fancy poisoning my neighbors with paint fumes. So once again, no cost. I found out through some pimp my car TV reality shows that in order to save time and money, some people have their cars wrapped in vinyl coating. It's way cheaper, the results are quite good, and it can be undone or changed if you get tired of having a bright orange glittery car. So I ordered 20 meters of cobalt blue vinyl film and got on wrapping. This was so easy, even my dog couldn't do it. All you had to do was cut the right shape and apply it with a heat gun and a plastic spatula to avoid air bubbles. In two days I had the whole car wrapped, and if I ever want to change the color or need to fix a scratch, it's a day's job away. So the car was finally finished just in time before autumn arrived, and I began preparing to move it to the garage for its final assembly. Now if you remember, I mentioned way back that because I didn't have any space to build a car other than the terrace in my parents' house, I would have to completely build a car there and then disassemble it again in order to take it to the garage, then assemble it together again, and finally I would be able to start it for the first time. Now when I welded the chassis, uh, it weighed no more than 30 kilograms by itself. In fact, I could grab it with both my hands and move it about. But now with everything bolted onto it, it weighed close to 600 kilograms. So I took everything I could out of the car that was heavy. And then I asked my brother-in-law and two other friends to help me take the chassis, one on each corner, by hand, out of the terrace, through the narrow garden door, all the way around the building and into the garage. Now because I live in a block of flats, my neighbors couldn't really see what exactly I was doing to make all that noise over the years until they saw us manhandling a chassis out into the garden. I mean, I wish I had a camera at that time to record all the different faces that poked out of each flat. There was a good mix of faces. Some were completely dumbfounded, some were laughing, some were worried. Even one of my neighbors actually came down and helped us carry the car. I was the entertainment for that evening at my building. So once in the garage, I went on to reassemble the car, but this time for good.
in the next episode. Will it start or will it explode? I switched the ignition on, uh, everything lit up, the fuel pump primed, everything was ready for the big moment I had waited for all these years. And then I twisted the key. Now ready for its next and final stage, getting him approved for use on the public road. This meant taking it all the way from Spain, passing through France, stopping at Bordeaux for the first night, then on to Calais, through the Euro Tunnel and into England. We packed everything we needed, we hitched the trailer and set off. 